Good morning all. This is Firas Nasser and today we'll be starting a new course. Today we'll be starting our course, An Introduction to Railway Systems. The aim of this course is to provide you with a quick understanding of different railway systems that will help you in your career. The core, this course will be followed by highly specialized courses that is more suitable to a more specialized audience. So let me start with my presentation. Yes, so this is the, this lecture overview. I will give you a quick introduction about the lecturer, who am I? Then we'll have a quick introduction about the course and the course structure, how this course is structured, what kind of things you really need to be doing. Then we will be going through the different chapters of this course. The first chapter will be talking about railway planning and operations. The second one will be talking about railway rolling stock. The third one is about railway electrification and traction. The fourth one is about railway systems engineering. The fifth one is about railway infrastructure systems. Then we'll be talking about signaling systems, economics, special topics in railway systems until we reach advanced studies in railway systems. Then we'll conclude with some highlights. So the lecturer, the legend Firas Nasser. Why I chose the legend and who is Firas Nasser? So I have finished a bachelor degree from the University of Jordan in civil engineering. Then I have uh, pursued a degree in the University of Birmingham in railway systems. It was master's degree in railway systems integration and it, it was from the University of Birmingham. I was the, I, I think I was the first in my class, but definitely I have finished the course with distinction. Then why we have chosen the legend? So we say I have chosen this specialization against all odds. So I am from Jordan. And Jordan is a country that have a heritage uh, railway, but it does not have any, uh, any big metro or any high speed, high speed rail systems. So the thing is that I, have, I thought the, the region in general, the Middle East region should have a strong capability in railway engineering. And as a young man, I, I wanted to distinguish myself from the crowd, I thought, doing a master's degree in the UK will definitely put me at a much better uh, advantage than the others. And the second thing is I did not want to follow the tragedy of the commons. By that, I did not just want to uh, do a degree that everyone is doing and then not being sure of what I really want to do and not to have a specialization and sometimes ending up in a situation that you did, you did not choose. So from there, many things have evolved in my career. So we finished the master's degree, we, have, we filed the patent and we tried to present it to different railway organizations in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Then the University of Birmingham offered a full PhD scholarship for me. And after maybe one year of doing this PhD, I had a bad incident uh, with a by uh, taking a wrong decision with the traveling with a wrong scientist, which has led me in addition to uh, family circumstances to, to leave this PhD. I worked for a very short period with a, TOV, uh, with a company called TUF Rhineland in Abu Dhabi. And due to racism and social dis uh, disclusion, we ended up in a, leaving this company then I worked in a completely different path than the railway path. Uh, we, I worked in, in a company in terms of building materials. Then uh, I have built my own startup in technology. 
And this is why we call the legend. So the legend who has come from, a, from a, an area which does not have a big railway, but he decided to pursue this career, then he's facing uh, serious social discrimination and serious injustice. But even this, he continued to try to push his uh, career in railways. So how I have done this, we, uh, in the beginning, we have filed a patent called Shadid Tunnel that was about wind blown sand. That was my MSc dissertation. And in my technology startup, I have actually developed some kind of an inspection solution for the railway environment. And you can go to my YouTube channel and have a look at that. Uh, and also, even after leaving this PhD in 2018 and outside of academia and outside of uh, even the industry and outside of any incentive to be, a, to be in a position to contribute to the railway knowledge or community. So I have published a paper about blockchain technology and railways. And uh, you can see this on IEEE, just search IEEE for us. Nasser has been downloaded more than I think 370 times or something now. So the, the legend is the one who is working against all odds and, ha and building a competitive advantage in a specialization that is not always from, uh, let me say, that is, not in a, that is not known that his people or his group of, uh, or his community is have a strong specializing uh, specialization so well everybody likes himself but definitely uh, i see my career to be uh, to have uh, an element of that young man who wants to gain knowledge and to want to help and to try to promote science to promote the innovations but is being faced by continuous rejections, continuous social discrimination. Even that, he carries on with it on his way and publish papers and try to build uh, new technology and eventually even making this course. So the question is why I'm making this course. And so the, the, this course, we will be doing it as part of Firas University, which is an online university. And I'm doing this course after 10 years of leaving my MSc. So that's a very long time. So 10 years after leaving my MSc and I will be doing this course. So bear with me, it would be very interesting for a journey. Now I need to talk about who's this course for. This course is for people who would like to gain uh, knowledge to, uh, about railway systems engineering in general. And they want to try to specialize in this topic even farther. So this uh, course, usually you, you would be like a fourth year engineering student, a fourth year engineering student, or maybe a master student, or maybe someone working in the industry for some time, then he happened to have a, a to, to, ha to work in a railway course, or he has to gain some knowledge about railways. So this course is suitable for these people. So, Who's this course is uh, not suitable for? If you want to design a system after finishing this course or to design track geometry or to design, let me say, uh, railway systems from scratch, then you need to watch the next courses that will be coming. So if you would like to use this course to gain specific skill that will help you in applying it in a project, this course is not for you. Also, this course is not for someone who would like to do highly specialized uh, technology development. So if you want to build the next signaling system, this course is very early start for you because we will go into a higher level of specialization and we'll talk about how to develop railway systems. But we will, I w what I can say that this course is for someone who has some engineering knowledge and he wants to be in further engineering and knowledge and systems engineering, rather than someone who wants to apply knowledge and skill directly after finishing the course, or he would like to even not apply uh, traditional skills, but actually need to build something from scratch. This can be useful, but it's not the best way. Now, why am this course? Interesting question. So as I mentioned, 
I am not working with any university. This is my own university. For us, university will be teaching very interesting topics, very advanced, very unique, and we'll try to do it slowly using the best technologies and the best educational tools. I'm doing this course because uh, I want to uh, many people to know about my work in the industry, uh, to know about my experience, to know about my level of knowledge, but also I'm doing this course, hopefully, maybe some people in this world will be able to pick up some knowledge and try to contribute to the industry. I care so deeply about the railway industry and we need young people who really understand the industry to a level that they can contribute in terms of innovation. Maybe they can't have a job because we have a job crisis, but we, we need really very smart people to work on uh, some of the strongest problems that the industry is facing. So the final thing I will talk about is our code of conduct. So usually I come across with so many people who would like to assess me or to judge me or to try uh, to see what, how much do I know and so on. So b basically, in, at this stage of my life, I have overcome all kinds of assessment and all kinds of judgments. So in many cases, I don't accept judgment. I might accept judgment from people who really are, who have very strong accomplishments and very strong achievements. And these maybe always can fall into two categories. Either you are really a very successful entrepreneur who have really solutions at the scale of Google search engine or something like this, or you are somewhat a professor of a global university and you have a very strong impact, and you have a very strong following, and you really have a strong support that, that, that can support your, uh, your view or your judgment. If you are coming here to benefit from this course, then you, are, you have the right code of conduct. If you are coming to this course to try to assess, to judge, to try to, uh, 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 to, try to uh, somehow not benefit, but to try to cause arguments, then this course is not for you. So that was for us Nasser the legend. You should always remember that. And uh, uh, we start our course. So that's that's few pictures. That's me in uh, Istanbul, in Istanbul, in uh, Istanbul Metro near uh, Aylik Çeşme uh, uh, Metro Station. This is me also in Istanbul, the second page presenting at my paper, and the third one. This is me uh, doing my solutions in Spectro, which is a very good solutions for inspection, but it did not see the life because of lack of funding, but it definitely it was one of the best solutions that can be applied on several uh, industries and several areas uh, related to inspection. So the course structure. The course structure will be discussing chapters. These chapters are organized based on railway systems. Uh, the structure was inspired by Felix Schmidt. He is a very famous professor. He is from Switzerland who had uh, traveled to the UK in, uh, near in the 70s, gained some knowledge about the railway industry, then built an MEC course about the railway industry of his own. He started the, uh, the course in Sheffield University, then moved it to Birmingham University, and now he has retired. Felix has done great work in bringing industry leaders together and also in bringing great knowledge uh, about railway systems from different uh, this uh, from different disciplines and from different topics because the different railway disciplines or railway systems were siloed and Felix tried to bring all of that in a in a one MSc course and for that we owe him great debt and we wish him great retirement ahead now, the course is also based on systems engineering approach. There are different ways to understand things and systems engineering, a well-established discipline that is used in defense, in telecommunication, in space, and in many other uh, disciplines, and we'll be using this, way, this discipline in, in understanding the course. And uh, 
we will talk about what is systems engineering in chapter four in more details. I will try to make the presentations 25 minutes presentations. I don't want the lectures to be too long or I, too short. We will have enough amount of time to convey the knowledge, but also we should we should not uh, uh, we should not exceed the 25 minutes so people can still can, are still engaged. We'll provide practical examples along with industry examples from our knowledge. And hopefully if things work well, I will invite guest lecturer through Zoom from industry and academia. I have very good contacts in uh, Turkey and maybe we'll try to bring a few people from other universities in the Arab world. And maybe I try also some people would be willing to do some presentation from Europe, the UK, the USA or Australia. This has to be coordinated. And maybe we would have some lecturers from Iran. I am one of the guys on a personal level believe that we need to engage with Iran uh, in academia, but we don't know what uh, people uh, would be thinking about this. So we'll take it uh, lightly. Now, the third thing, uh, the, the, another part will be having clearly related skills need identification and clear path for realization. So when we talk about different topic, maybe you say, okay, this is good knowledge, How, what I can do with that? So people would like to learn about, the, uh, learn information, but also they would like to gain some skills that they can use. So we'll show you the difference between knowledge and skills in a clear way for every chapter or we discuss in details, not in this uh, introduction lecture, but, and we'll tell you for this knowledge has led to the development of this skill. So learn, uh, knowing about oper uh, railway operations led about having a skills related to operational planning where you use this software and with this software you can produce timetables and the more you uh, the more uh, tables you have produced and uh, the more experience you have will not have any quizzes or exams but will be guiding you on clear research and projects and maybe we will accept some of you in Firas Nasser community also uh, Firas Nasser uh, community is quite a prestigious community that accepts only high profile individuals with special uh, commitment and uh, hard work traits. So please learn from the course. We will, we will suggest some research project, but don't put high expectations on joining the community. Also, this is a possibility, although this is a possibility, but the community is really for certain individuals uh, who would have to lead the future of the world. So railway planning and operations. So in chapter one, we'll talk about a little bit about railway history, how uh, uh, the train started in the UK with James Watt inventing the steam locomotive and Isambard Brunel having this great, uh, uh, great projects that he would like to build the Great Western Railway and so on. Uh, and how it, it, it continued growing until the car was invented. And then everyone moved to uh, buses and there was some kind of uh, decline in rail usage until we reached the stage that government started uh, stop uh, railway funding or decrease railway funding. And then they moved to privatization so moving the railway to the private sector, then eventually we to see a new boom of metros for, for the developed countries around the world and for uh, high speed rail. So in the last decade, there was a huge change in the railway land, landscape in the world. So for example, cities like Riyadh, Doha, Dubai, maybe uh, did not have Metros now they have metros. Dubai had it, but maybe they have now uh, an extended line. Uh, Riyadh did not have a metro. Now the metro is almost complete, and Doha did not have a metro. Now the metro is almost complete. So we see also change in the Middle East region in terms of uh, railway. It has evolved. 
but also we uh, on the uh, on the global scale china china is, uh, now have the largest high speed railway network in the world also turkey has developed so many projects and now they have very uh, strong railway network not much change in the us but that was very big change in those uh, countries now also there are new thinking about new railway systems so people are thinking about maglev and people think about virgin hyperloop or virgin hyperloop one which is kind of a, a, a railway that is working on a, a maglev kind of technology in a vacuum so two aspects of this technology that there is a vacuum that uh, remove the air resistance then you would have a, a train that is moving on maglev or uh, on mechanic uh, magnetic liftation is if magnet is magnetic liftation but there is uh, as i was talking to the ceo there is a passive and active and they have a kind of a different technology than the japanese technology also we don't know the details as as we should now we'll talk about in this chapter about railway organizations and operation structures we'll talk about what is an infrastructure owner? And every country has an infrastructure owner. And what is an operator? And we'll give an example from different countries. We'll talk about the EU directives that have that decided that the infrastructure owners should be different than the infrastructure operators. So they how they started to split the operation of the railway in a different in different organizations. We'll also talk about Roscos and who leads the trains. We'll talk about rolling stock manufacturers. And this is, can we talk about it in the railway industry supply chain? But while the railway organization and operation structure may be about understanding how the railway operates in different levels and in different countries and in different places, railway industry supply chain is understanding how these, where did, ra where did railway come from? So if you are a young kid and ask, where did this train come from? Come from will ask you and if you ask where did this ballast uh, ballast came from or where, where did this bolt came from will be will be a uh, will be able to answer you we'll talk about kbi for railway organizations how different railway organizations are pushing for safety punctuality reliability quality and how they are pushing for customer satisfaction and of course for revenue We'll talk about theoretical frameworks in thinking about railway safety. How we can how we can declare the railway system as safe. We will talk about risk and consequences. We'll talk about barriers and defense in depth uh, uh, theory. We'll talk about different way of thinking about safety. We'll talk about human behavior and how uh, humans can add a layer of safety to systems, but maybe they can add, a, add an, another risk. Then we'll talk about railway types. What is a metro? What is a high-speed rail? What, what is the difference between a tram and a, tra a metro? And what is the difference between uh, an intercity uh, rail and the metro or a suburban rail and the metro what is a tram train and of course there are different different uh, what is a people mover of course railway is a system where you have a guided vehicle but of course there are different types of those vehicles and different types of where do they stop and uh, different arrangement on the capacity they have then we'll talk about railway planning how do we plan for capacity demand think about cities and how much how much how what kind of railway we need to have for uh this city and on what kind of timetable or and we'll talk about socio-economical benefits is it in the city benefit to introduce a new railway system or what kind of social benefits does it bring does it bring uh, uh connectivity does it bring integration does it bring equality across the country does it bring revenue does it increase their land prices is it good for the environment and 
So this is about socio-economical benefits planning and think about railway as a, as a, as a system that bringing uh, socio-economical benefits more than maybe sometimes the revenues. When we talk about engineering planning, how do we plan maintenance, how, what is uh, position time, and how, wh when do railways do their position time? How do actually they do, how railway projects emerge? Uh, what, kind, what kind of tools they use? What is systems engineering in terms of planning? And, uh, and of course, many, many other uh, topics we'll talk uh, as now we'll talk about safety and risk. And I talked about safety before and risk. Talk about a little bit hazard logs. We'll talk about uh, how you, uh, uh, you have to uh, log different risks and different uh, consequences that are associated with these uh, risks. And you have to reduce what is called hazard logs. That is being said, so let's have a look at some of the pictures we have here. So this is uh, what Felix Schmid called the, the railway butterfly. It's basically uh, an illustration that demonstrates that the railway nature is complex. So it's talking about the railway nature. It talks about that the railway is an interdependent system. The components of these systems are connected and they are interdependent on each other. The train is dependent on the rail, and the rail uh, and the, tra the transport uh, uh, output is dependent on the on the rail. So the the train is dependent on the rail, but all the rail uh, without a transport output is meaningless. So we'll, it talks about diversity. How the, there are so many different components in this system. You have ballast, you have, that is kind of an earth uh, earth material, but also you have kind of uh, rails that are made of steel but you have also complex systems condition monitoring systems and signaling systems that are made of electronic electronics but also you have may uh, have uh, communication systems so it's it's a, it's a really very diverse kind of uh, a system that has so many different components and so much uh, diversity and variability Felix split diversity and variability, but I almost see them the same. Then he talks about dispersion, how different components of these systems are dispersed all around the city, all around the country. So how you can control a system that is dispersed all over the place. The second picture is about railway planning timetable. Eventually you need to be able to reduce a timetable that take people at the peak hour and bring them uh, morning time and bringing them at the evening time. Or if you are a smarter, uh, a smarter planner, maybe you can, you should be able to distribute the, the demand, especially with these days with the remote working environment and COVID-19. So maybe even the, the demand graph change. The third picture is about some of the, uh, the Saudi Arabia railway line, so uh, railway network. So you can see the green line is the north-south project. When I was doing my MSc, this project was under construction. Now it's almost complete. You have this uh, uh, Dama and the red line, the Mam Riyadh line, and this is controlled by Saudi railway organization. I have visited Saudi railway organization, and we have done a presentation for them almost uh, nine years ago. And the purple line is the Saudi land bridge, which aims to connect like the, uh, the, 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 the Gulf, uh, uh, the Arab Gulf to the, or the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea. And also the Arab Gulf or to the Persian Gulf, I don't, we don't bring politics here, but to bring the two sides of the water together. And the yellow line is the very interesting one, is the high speed, high speed rail line, which is connected to Medina, and th this is a, a, a great uh, accomplishment, and definitely it will help many people that is doing Hajj in Saudi every year. So now the second chapter is about railway rolling stock, and some people ask, what's a rolling stock? So the rolling stock is, is the vehicle, so we, this is a, it's a kind of a description that something is rolling. So if we change the, the, the word rolling stocks to railway vehicles, it also makes many a good sense for many people. So we'll talk about how these vehicles are running. So 
traction are they are uh, being dragged by a locomotive or they are they have multiple motors that are distributed along the train of course they are, they, you always see the train you think all the carriages are equal but in many cases you would have the locomotive is dragging the all the whole train the carriages and you can see this in freight trains and which sometimes using diesel but also you can see a multi-motor uh, uh, trains, which actually there are several motors that are distributed across the whole uh, train and they are being fed by electricity. So different drives, sometimes electricity, sometimes the railway is electrified. You take the energy from the overhead line through a bandograph. Sometimes you use fuel like diesel uh, sometimes use fuel like hydrogen. So there are even innovations in terms of inner, uh, how, how the, what kind of uh, energy does uh, railway systems use in different vehicles. We'll talk a little bit about materials and with materials we, talk, we mean uh, what are the materials that are made of these uh, vehicles. Um, so is it wood like uh, before, like the 18th then in 19th century, or is it uh, steel or is it aluminium? So now a lot of uh, railways are using aluminium, but of course a, a, a version that is uh, that can uh, accommodate the stresses uh, that is coming from uh, different parts. Uh, uh, sorry, from different forces. Uh, and we'll talk about railway aerodynamics, how the train behave when it, uh, when it passes through the air envelope. And the aerodynamics in railways is a very big topic because it affects the energy consumption in the train. And maybe you always remember that the aerodynamics of the train is, is always affected by the square of the velocity. So we'll talk about carriage capacity and carriage selections. How do you choose different carriages based on your uh, metro types? So uh, based, based on your different train types. So a metro will have a different interior than a high speed train. And this is because the journey is shorter, the, uh, the, the people would uh, jump on and off, while a high speed train, maybe people would like to take a journey for two hours, maybe they need they need to use a table, they need to use the internet, and so on. We'll talk about railway suspension system, how this vehicle can accommodate all of these vibrations that is coming from the ground, that is coming from this dynamic movement, this interaction between the wheel and the rail. We'll talk about bogey designs, spring and, and dampers, and talk about the, the primary suspension system, the secondary suspension system, you talk about the active suspension system, which is about measuring the amount of force or the amount of uh, vibration that is coming and uh, changing the parameters of the suspension system to suit this, uh, to, uh, to suit this uh, re uh, reaction or uh, forces in a suitable way that produce the less effect on the passengers. So eventually you need to have a, a comfortable ride and why you would be having comfortable rides on trains is because of suspension systems and speeds of course we'll talk about three railway vehicle dynamics and by that we mean the different uh, uh, movements that uh, a railway vehicle might have and this is associated with vehicle dynamics in general you would have a roll your pitch vertical uh, kind of movement which you need to uh, calculate different forces. So uh, the roll movement will, will, in will introduce a new kind of forces, while the yaw will introduce a different type of forces and so on. But this is the general movement of the vehicles of the train. We'll talk about railway vehicle testing and access acceptance. Can I build a, a railway vehicle and sell it? How easy is it to build a railway vehicle? What kind of testing is needed? What is crashworthiness? What is, uh, what, how we can do tests? Is simulation uh, is acceptable as a test? And we'll talk about railway wheel vehicle uh, dynamics and train maintenance and operation. So how, how we make sure that the trains are running 
to an acceptable level of quality. So this is me again inside uh, uh, in, uh, in this metro in uh, Istanbul in Istanbul metro. And here we in the second picture we have a picture of the Shinkansen and the Shinkansen high speed rail. And I choose the, this picture to show you the train nose, which is, is designed in this way to accommodate for the aerodynamics impact. So, and a lot of people say, sometimes they say actually some, uh, the aerodynamics, is, the aerodynamics might be uh, somehow similar to different designs. But the nose gives the railway, the train, an appealing look. And the third picture is about kind of a, a, a simulation, a finite element analysis simulation of a train, and it's being, it's moving towards a rigid wall. So it's try, and it, we, you can see that this is a simulation of crashworthiness. How the material will behave if you have hit this uh, train with this wall? And when you do this simulation, you get results on what kind of failures you will be getting and uh, where, the, where, where, where the stresses will be higher and so on. Now, we'll, the third chapter is about railway drive and energy systems. And by this, uh, I mean how, 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 how does railway move, moves, how does trains move, where do they get their energy from, and how movement happens. So you would be thinking how this, uh, for example, uh, the train is getting an electricity from the overhead line and this is moving through a group of power electronics until it's reached the motors which runs and drag the train or uh, so, and uh, sorry, uh, which run and drags and move the movement, movement to the axle and the axle move the mov movement to the, the wheels. So you need to understand how the energy ha has moved from the pantograph or from the overhead line through the train going till uh, it created a movement on the wheel. Then you will be we'll talking about, thing, uh, about types of railway drive system. We talk that you, you can have a diesel train, you can have a hybrid train, a little bit of diesel and a little bit of electricity. And as Hijaz Railway, you can have a coal train that all uh, or some trains in, chi uh, uh, trains in China that can be an environmental desire, a disaster. Also electrification, you can have a, a fully electrified line and others. And others, there are some attempts to use ethanol and as I said before, hydrogen. And there is a one hydrogen train that is operating and, or maybe more. We'll talk about types of motor, AC motor, DC motor, permanent magnets motor, and we'll talk about vehicle power electronics. We'll talk about how, what kind, what's a chopper, what's an inverter, uh, and what, what, what kind of uh, form of energy does an inverter, uh, inverter change? What is AC, what is DC, what is a three-phase three AC, and, uh, or, <laughs> so we will talk about vehicle power electronics, and it's a very uh, important lecture. Some people think it's a specialized. If you are coming from a uh, civil engineering or mechanical engineering discipline, you would think this is a, a kind of a new th thing to you. If you are coming from electrical engineering discipline, you would be thinking, wow, this is something that is not that hard. So, and maybe it's not clear to talk about energy management approaches, how, that, how different trains consume different energy. Maybe they use different strategies like coasting, which is like not using energy on an, uh, a degraded elevation and letting the train use its own weight. Uh, uh, so this is called coasting and many drivers use it uh, while they are driving their own cars on a on a, on, a, on, a, on a gradient or on a slope gradient. So that was chapter three. And you can see the picture on the left is the electrified line. And maybe the pantograph is not clear, but you can see how the train is getting the electricity from the overhead line. And we'll talk briefly about 
why there are two lines, what is an earthing line, and uh, uh, even we'll talk about resistance. So some people ask, what is these big uh, kind of springs that are uh, that are on on catenary, on catenary and they, they are they are resistance. The second one is about motors, and you can see how the magnetic poles are uh, generating a magnetic uh, field that is generating uh, a kind of movement. And on the third one, you see a block diagram, while you can see maybe the power electronics at the bottom of the train. By the way, in many, in many trains, they, sometimes they are at the bottom, sometimes they are at the top of the train. And you can see the bantograph is coming and you see that there is a main inverter here and there is a DC link and uh, three phase AC motor. Uh, so you, this is talking about how our electronics are moving, the, uh, are uh, taking uh, electricity from the bantograph to the motor. The fourth, uh, the fourth chapter is about railway systems engineering. It's about railway systems engineering introduction. What is railway systems engineering? What, is, it, uh, is it meaning like there is a rolling stock system and there is an infrastructure system and there is a, or is it a completely different discipline? So railway systems engineering is a discipline that is concerned of understanding uh, complex systems that have interconnected parts. And it, it do so by uh, using a kind of different metho uh, methods, sometimes of using block diagrams, sometimes of using uh, what is called requirements engineering, and sometimes we, we call, uh, calling for reliability, calculations, availability, maintenance or safety, and we'll talk about this in details. It also will prove case studies of railway systems engineering in practice, Railway systems engineering can be used in two ways. It can be used to produce a new system, but also it can be used to govern the development of a system or, or in place. So it can be used to produce a, a small uh, signaling system or a small condition monitoring system, but it also can be used to track the, and govern the development of a, a new metro or a new high-speed railway line and uh, uh, you would be tracking uh, the development uh, through all the stages of the project. So there is a link between railway systems engineering and project management, especially in, in systems that have to be, uh, that are interconnected and that have to work together and that have to, be, that have uh, some kind of uh, dependence on each other. And we'll discuss also the concept of dependability. This system is a dependable system. So RAMS is, a, is an acronym for Railway uh, Reliability, Availability, Maintenance, and Safety. Requirements Engineering is a, is a discipline that people will try to uh, write clear requirements from uh, contracts or from uh, standards. Uh, or, or on what the, what the system should really achieve at the end. And case studies of railway systems engineering in practice, I'm just trying to show you some of the examples where people use railway systems engineering, and that's ISA, which is Independent Safety Assessment, where you, have, where you try to make sure that the, the system has satisfied all the requirements for safety. And you try to, to do this in an independent manner. So the picture in the left is the V diagram, which is a very famous graph in railway systems engineering, where you start from uh, uh, writing your requirements, then you try to transfer these requirements to function, and then you transfer these functions to components, and from these co uh, components, then you try to uh, build physical uh, systems, and from uh, these physical systems, you uh, validate that uh, these, uh, sorry, you, you verify. And there is difference between verification and validation, and sometimes people are very much concerned about the definitions. So you verify that actually all of your functions that has uh, been uh, outlined at the beginning has been achieved, 
and eventually you validate that all of the systems requirements have been achieved and validated so the v diagram is a way for seeing how the system is being is being developed and how every requirement every function is being verified and every uh, uh, requirement is being validated the second picture is about system architecture so when systems they have become uh, complex uh, projects have different stages of delivery uh, systems might have might have different uh, connections with different systems sometimes they are dependent on them sometimes they take data from them and people would like to understand this complexity and try to capture it in a graphical manner but they want to do this in an organized way so you can see the, the, they developed an architecture systems architecture is a uh, is a is a well established discipline that has been used in software as well as defense as well as space telecommunication and many other systems the third one is a, like a control room where people look at the screen and use different systems and really interact with different systems and uh, they interact with the signaling system they inter interact with the uh, passenger information system maybe and they interact with other systems and this is where you see the human uh, element this is the uh, where the human has also the human as a system has to interact with different systems and he's the controller so the systems engineering is a very very interesting discipline and you need to be understanding our chapters not only as they are uh, silo systems but you need to build a theoretical framework in your mind how a ballast is a system how a track is a system how a platform how the platform is a system how a vehicle is a system a vehicle is a vehicle is not a no you need to try to understand that the vehicle has a group of requirements and it has a group of uh, uh, functions and it is it, it is achieving them and it's actually interacting with the uh, with the infrastructure systems and with the signaling systems and this interaction sometimes is interdependent and so on to uh, to to be but to achieve the larger uh, 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 transport system uh, object so then eventually we think about what is systems and what is systems of systems so we'll talk about this in details in chapter four chapter five it's about railway infrastructure systems engineering and this is uh, the is the heaven of civil engineers they start to uh, become familiar with uh, railway engineering and they start to feel well this is something that we can relate to this is something we can like, grasp and understand so we'll talk about track geometry design what what are the um, uh, allowed uh, uh, radius for uh, curves what is a steep curve what is a uh, what, what is elevation what is a, what is a gradient and uh, how you can uh, design uh, railways in a way that is uh, economical but also can generate uh, some kind of socio-economical benefits so the, the easiest way is to draw a straight line but life is not always about that straight line there are geograph there are different uh, topographies and geography uh, geographical features in our maps that we need to uh, consider we'll talk about track cross-section design is it uh, of course um, some people think it's always standard no sometimes the track cross-section design for a high-speed rail is different than for uh, uh, an intercity uh, train is different than a metro is different than a, 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 a train inside a tunnel so we'll have a look at uh, cross-section design but in general this is uh, also associated with a standard uh, design the track structure we'll talk about how uh, what kind of forces and what kind of load does the train brings to the rails and how these, these rails took it take it to the uh, beds and from these beds to the sleepers and from the sleepers to the ballast and from uh, the ballast to the sub base or the, to the uh, to the ground layers so uh, this is the track structures we'll talk about bridges and tunnels 
what kind of dynamic load does railways bring to uh, bridges? Uh, how do we construct tunnels? What is a tunnel boring machines? What is an ATEM method? What is a cross cover method? So we'll talk about different uh, tunnels construction methods and, diff uh, and how uh, bridges are important for railways. Bridges are important for railways because you can't have uh, uh, kind of random elevation or random uh, gradient. Railways has a, a certain restrictions on the changes of, of, uh, of, of the elevation and the percentage of changes. We'll talk about ballast track versus slab track, the famous discussion why we should have ballast track, why we should have slab track, and it's all about maintenance costs, it's about uh, 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 also initial cost, it's about, so slab track is about having a cross section in tunnels or having using, using slab track in tunnels, using ballast track outside, so it's, a it's an economical discussion. We'll talk about stations, how uh, stations interact with trains and uh, how stations are designed for passengers flow, uh, how stations are designed as a, a two-way system where you, some people go to the platforms and some people exit the platforms. Very much similar to airports where people go to air, uh, uh, where there is a departures and arrivals. So stations and station design, how stations become iconic, uh, iconic, uh, iconic, fee, iconic uh, structures in a city, and uh, how stations be also become a place where you can generate an additional revenue through um, uh, renting space and through advertisement. Also, we'll talk about materials. What kind of materials are being used in railways? Uh, the palace is kind of an earth uh, material, but uh, the rails are from steel, and uh, sleepers are from concrete, and stations are a mix of all, which also have several systems. And we'll talk about materials that are being used in railways. Railways. We talk about switches and crossings, and with switches and crossing, we'll talk about uh, what are the kind of different switches, what's uh, what's uh, what's the different parts of the switch, what is a what is a what is a check rail, what is a what is a what is what is called a uh, switch uh, what is a, f a switch frog or what is a what is a gap what is the what is the I, sometimes i need to remember this what's the what's the closing gap of switches and what is a, a check rail what is the guard rail what is a what is let me say what's else i'm i'm i'm, th I'm thinking i'm trying to remembering the bars and uh, What's the switch nose? Uh, what's a what's a, a lock stretcher bar? What's a point machine? So you, we would be looking at the different uh, types of switches and crossings. What's a diamond switch? What kind of different switches there uh, 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 there is out there? So we'll be talking about different switches and crossings. So let's have a look at the pictures. Yes, this is the ballast with the train with the track. This is the ballast with the tra track like showing you that the road is clear ahead or the rail is clear ahead or the rail or a railway is clear ahead you have this uh, turnout or turnout is very much similar to a switch and you can see the nose you can see the the you can see the check rails you can see the signaling and you can see even the gap so that's that's uh, uh, switches in, in railways, and you can see the third one. You can see a cross section of a track structure, which is showing you the rails, the sleeper, the ballast. Then you have the sub ballast and the sub grade, and uh, the different ground layers. And this is, by the way, that this is uh, the sub grade and. Uh, sometimes they are called the embankment and embankment are a major 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 part of 
railway uh, structures. So we'll talk about, the, on the sixth chapter, we'll talk about railway signaling system. We'll talk about history of signaling systems, how people started with moving uh, a lever to, uh, to control the train by having someone uh, uh, on the train and just when you reach a, a switch, someone will just drop from the train, move that lever and you have that, you, you, then you can uh, carry on with your train to, the, to your destination we'll t until we reach the, this stage where we are dependent on digital systems and where we have this uh, moving block and uh, ETCS, uh, ETCS, ETCS signaling system, which is a European train control system, and uh, maybe even further development with the continuous improvement on 5G with communication-based train control. So we are seeing a great uh, development on the uh, train signaling and what kind of services it can bring to people inside the trains. We'll talk about signaling system components, what's uh, traffic light and what's uh, in-cap signaling and what's uh, a, a headway and what's a control center. Uh, and uh, so we'll talk about the different parts of the signaling system. We'll talk about railway signaling system types, and now there is already an established railway network across the globe, and we need to be talking about those systems. We'll talk about aspect systems. So you see some traffic lights have two lights, some have three, some have four, and they, those are called aspects. So what's the two aspects, what's three aspects, what's the four aspects, and what's the impact of this? on capacity, what's an ETCS, what is an ETCS level one, ETCS level two, ETCS level three, if there is, and what is metro signaling, and what is will be the signaling systems of railways and trains in the future. We'll talk a little bit about electromagnetic interference, that sometimes you have this uh, signal propagation and you have problems with uh, trains communicating with a signaling system, and how this is uh, can be called electromagnetic interference. We'll talk and how you can overcome this and how you can achieve electromagnetic compatibility. Types of signaling systems. So what I mean by types is, I think the previous one, I think this is a repetition. We'll talk about timetable calculations how understanding signaling systems and understanding the headways will help you to plan for capacity and to plan for your timetable. So this is uh, uh, the pictures on the left side. You can see this, uh, the, uh, what is called the S curve, which is really showing the uh, trains moving and stopping across the route. And if you are a planner, if you are a, uh, if you are planning the uh, railway journeys, you should be able to reduce these graphs to make sure that the trains does not interfere with each other or that the schedule is, allow is allowing to accommodate as many trains as you need. So this is kind of important that then you have uh, the second picture is showing you like European train signaling system and you can see this is like you are the driver, you are looking at at the railway ahead and you can see there is a traffic light and you are communicating with the mast, which is like a telecommunication tower and the other train is passing by, but also is communicating with that mast. And then you would look at onboard signaling system. So how does this, uh, how does uh, 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 trains detect signal? Do they detect it, uh, detect it from infrastructure through balises? So the yellow, uh, the, yellow, uh, the yellow square on the second picture is like a Belize, which is a system to transfer, uh, to, to, show the, uh, to show and to detect the train location and to, inform, to, to communicate with the train or to communicate with the onboard signaling systems on the train. So here you can see odometry subsystem and wheel sensors and uh, DMI, ERTMS, but in, 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 in short, this is all signaling, uh, onboard signaling systems that help to detect the signal from outside systems like the mast and the bellies. 
depending on the level of, of signaling or, and the type of signaling system you are using. We'll talk on chapter seven, we'll talk about railway economics. We'll introduce uh, economics, what's introduction economics, how railways is affected like any other economic system by supply and demand. Like if you place a supply uh, uh, railway station, maybe there, there will be an increase in demand for these services. You will also talk about railway socioeconomical benefits, how railway can help unemployment and can help uh, regeneration of uh, areas where if you, uh, and to increase the land prices and to provide higher valuation on different aspects and sometimes helping people to be connected and sometimes uh, shorter, uh, making the, distance, the time to work shorter and many, many other benefits. We'll talk about railways as a business. Is railway a profitable business? And is it not? What is a capital cost? What is an operational cost? And how can over uh, railways can generate revenue? And how they can maybe become profitable? We'll talk about life cycle costing. Is it only the cost that you pay at the beginning by building the infrastructure and running uh, the trains? Or there is a much longer cost uh, that you should be accommodating for and thinking about, which is including the life cycle of components and trains. And what is the life of a train? Maybe 30 years, maybe 20 years. What is the life of a track? And so on. So, uh, so we'll talk about railway assets management, uh, which is a, a, a way for uh, thinking about railway maintenance and railway operations in a, in a, in a, in a in a more organized way that can um, make sure that you take uh, decisions based on data and based on uh, based on risk and data. Uh, so railway assets management is a is a discipline for managing different activities that is happening on your railway network in an optimized manner from different. Uh, perspectives. It can be from economical perspective, from safety perspective, from environmental perspective. So you would be have an optimized decision uh, making based on the data that you have around your network and based on life cycle costing and many other aspects. Then we'll talk about railway infrastructure valuation, how you can evaluate a railway network and how you can utilize this valuation. Uh, that's railway economics. So you can see on the picture, on the left side picture, that's the total cost. You can see that uh, in the beginning uh, there was a, a high cost, then uh, the cost has decreased. It's become an operational cost. Then there was a refurbishment where the cost increased a little bit. Then there was a replacement of a component. So the, the, the cost has increased again. The second picture is showing you the socio-economical benefits of trains where you have to move all those people at a very low price and maybe at a, also at a small, uh, a small damage to the environment. The third one showing tickets is about uh, is showing an off-peak ticket, ticket, how uh, different railway organizations are using different uh, ticket uh, pricing uh, strategy to try to increase the demand. And the eighth chapter is about special topic in railway systems engineering. And so one of the special topics is railway assets management and railway maintenance management. We talked about this briefly, briefly human factors and ergonomics. We talk about how we need to design railway systems for humans, especially, for example, uh, the interiors of trains or the uh, or the platform or the uh, doors and uh, if there are doorsteps or there are no doorsteps. We talk about condition monitoring systems. That's another topic which show you it which help you in your maintenance of railways to make sure that your maintenance is moving from a maintain, a, a, some kind of a emergency maintenance to periodic maintenance to uh, a predictive maintenance and how condition monitoring systems help help you in achieving this roadmap. We'll talk about 
the understanding the railway industry. And by that, I will talk about my experience and how I, ha uh, how I understand the organization of different railway, uh, railway organization, how I understand the behavior of different railway organizations in the world. Are they closed organizations? Are they open organizations? How do they behave? And you should really understand that uh, railways was always and still highly connected with the government. So sometimes the behavior of uh, you, you would see in a, in a completely private enterprise, you might not be able to see this within a railway organization. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, discussion about my interaction. It's a negative interaction in general. It's not as uh, positive as someone would expect, but uh, it, it, it was not uh, our uh, best uh, outcome. So I will tell you about the railway industry. The uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about factories. Uh, we'll talk about railway operators. We'll talk about infrastructure owners. We'll talk about railway uh, components suppliers and more. So let us understand this industry on where you can contribute or where you can fit or is there a place for you. So. It's, it's very important that you understand the industry to uh, be able to plan your future in a, in, a, in a proper way and to see if there is a, really a place for uh, your ideas, thoughts, and contribution within the industry. So this is the uh, pictures. This is the interior of a train. The second picture is showing deterioration models, which is showing like how track deteriorates with time, then you have a, then you do a maintenance activity which is called tamping. And tamping is just about using uh, uh, an, uh, an equipment with, uh, with kind of clues to vibrate the track, uh, to vibrate the blast and make sure that the track geometry is in, is in alignment. And you can see that in the beginning that track geometry has deteriorated, but with tamping, uh, the alignment has come back. And the third picture is showing condition monitoring systems which are distributed all around the train, the track, and uh, the train and the track. So, the nine chapter is a quite an advanced chapter, and this is really advanced even for global professors. So, it's a, it's a very novel chapter. So, in this chapter, uh, we'll talk about advanced studies in railway systems. So the first part I will try to cover railways as part of a complex adaptive system. So I had this view 10 years ago. It's a very visionary of view of looking at physical infrastructure as systems that can evolve and develop and communicate with each other and have a behavior. And sometimes you'd be thinking how a physical system like the railways would have such a capability but you should not think about evolution in the same way, uh, evolution of man-made systems as you, in the same way you think about evolution of biological system. So maybe an evolution of a man-made system would happen because a man would choose to change a component. So for example, maybe you would have a signaling system, but the system has evolved because there was a decision to change that signaling system and to accommodate for a uh, higher capacity. And by the way, uh, railway planning and the railway organization and railway costing is always affected by the kind of innovation development. So complex understanding railways as part of a complex adaptive systems and how we can benefit from this understanding and how we can benefit from this understanding in terms of design, in terms of planning, how we can de develop from this understanding in terms of even introducing new systems and innovation and bringing new ideas. So, uh, so it, it, and it's not only that, but the railways also has to, uh, to communicate with the larger transport modes. So the future definitely rail railway systems has to uh, communicate with autonomous cars and has to communicate even with the last mile uh, vehicles and with the, uh, Maybe you'd have bots moving people from stations or their homes, or maybe you have small uh, micro in, uh, kind of autonomous, uh, uh, autonomous bikes. 
what's wrong with you just have a bike and uh, take you when you come from the station to the train then come back to the train it's a, it's a possible it's a possibility and it's a, it's a if, if autonomous cars are expensive maybe autonomous bikes would be uh, would be a good solution for the last mile problem but anyway that's just me thinking it's not uh, it's not uh, something that is there or it's not something that there are a few ideas that and few systems that have been developed, but what we need to be discussing is how we can see the whole system as a complex adaptive system, and how we can see that the railway is fitting within the transport system, and how we can see that the transport system is fitting within the whole fabric of human interaction. The second topic I will be talking about advanced railway and transport technologies. We'll talk about uh, aspects related to artificial intelligence, aspects related to nanotechnology and materials, aspects related, aspects, uh, related to uh, uh, the digitization. So, uh, for example, blockchain, I have a paper on blockchain and we thought maybe blockchain can help in, in integration and in bringing data and uh, fighting cybersecurity and so on. And uh, so we'll talk about advanced railway uh, and transport technologies and by this we mean technologies that can really advance the industry or can help in uh, in, in in pushing the industry capability and performance to higher levels finally finally Uh, finally, we'll be having conclusions and highlights. The course is the beginning of your. Okay, let me just uh, put the last slide. The, the course is the beginning of your learning journey on railway systems engineering. We have talked briefly about different railway systems that you should be knowing about, but eventually you will have to specialize in a specific system. We expect that some of you will be able to gain sufficient knowledge and skills to be able to contribute to railway projects and transport industry in general. I apologize, this is once a very long uh, lecture. It was an introduction lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. For sure, the coming lectures will be much uh, shorter and will definitely be much more precise and hopefully they can provide you with a proper amount of information and knowledge on the railway industry. We see you on the next lecture. Stay updated with Firas University so you know the recent development. So without further ado, we wish you a great day and we shall say, see you next time.